Welcome everyone to our webinar today. We are happy to have you with us and happy to be talking about regulatory trends and updates and data integrity and data governance for 2023. Kind of like a reflection on what happened last year. I see the audience is filling up. We we have a full house today. I also see a couple people who who are who are regulars in our in our call. So welcome. We're happy to have you here. Uh, just a couple of admin topics before we jump in. This session is being recorded and later on we're gonna we're gonna cut the videos and do different little things and see how we can how we can publish parts of it. Um, we have a Q&A session as well as a chat session here. That won't be part of the recording, but if you want to use it for any questions you may have in this session, on the top right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a chat window. You'll also see a Q&A. You'll see polls, which we'll be going through today, and you'll see handouts. Um, I'm just going to send you a quick message so you can see what the chat looks like. Hello, everyone. If you'd like during the call, uh, during the session at any time, write something in there. I'll be moderating the call today um, and Ulrich will be will be walking you through the slides. So I see a couple more people came in again. Welcome, everyone. It's great to have you here at the Compliance Alliance. My name is James Frankham and together with my colleague Ulrich Kölisch, we're here today to present data integrity and data governance updates from the previous year, show you a couple of really cool tools that are out there, some of the things that has happened in industry, and of course, share our knowledge with you. Um, our, our presenter today, Ulrich Kurlisch, I, I'd really like to introduce him and then I'll hand over the slides to you, Ulrich. So Ulrich Kurlisch is a partner in GXPCC and his expertise lies in life science compliance and particularly specialization in data integrity and audits. He runs the GXPCC Compliance Academy, bringing the brightest minds from academia into industry. Uh, Ulrich has been on the forefront of data integrity initiatives and in his previous eight years has supported many organizations in pharmaceutical and biotech sector executing data integrity campaigns. Ulrich has experience in consulting for audit preparation and conduction in the GMP and in the GCP area and precedes special interest groups and affiliations. Furthermore, Ulrich has trained international agencies on behalf of ICH on the ICH quality guidelines, ICH Q9 and Q10. Uh, next to that, Ulrich is a program committee member and speaker at international conferences and is a welcome panelist with the DIA, PDA, FDA, and other industry affiliate forums. Ulrich has a PhD in physics in the area of medical imaging from the Technical University of Munich and was educated at the Harvard Business School. He lives in Germany and is a guiding light of the local life science community. With that, Ulrich, uh, that's who you yes. are. Um, everyone else, like I said, there's a chat here. I see it's already working. Everyone, let's go ahead and start. Ulrich, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, James. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we are really um, filled up the, the audience now. Um, and I'm happy to share some, some insights with you about uh, regulatory trends uh, in the last year, uh, but not only limited to the last year. So um, today we will have a, a little walkthrough um, through our uh, agenda at the first point. Um, so uh, let's, let's have a look here. Um, we got different points today. Um, I have a little screen issue, so I have to apologize for a little break. Um, do you see my screen? We do. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for this little for this little issue. So here's here's my. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen again because it was uh, written that PowerPoint might need to restart. In this case, James will will host you for a while. I, I've heard um, LinkedIn okay. has classes on how to use it. So that's awesome. Oh, okay. I didn't take that. So this is the agenda for today. Let's see. Um, I will give a little very brief introduction. Uh, this will be very short because I really want to show you something today. Um, we'll have a look at the FDA inspection dashboard um, and uh, we will then go th to the more theoretical part. Um, what is new? What is hot? What are the, the updates in the guidelines? Um, of course, we'll have case studies. I got a lot of case studies with me. However, I don't want to yeah, to fire you down with uh, with slides and case studies. So I'm I'm always happy 
uh, to answer your questions, um, please bring them, them in. So this is a part of the talk where we are also very flexible and we can, can jump a bit forward uh, if we have many topics interesting uh, for you. And then we make a little outlook. Um, so what is next? Uh, what do we expect for this year? Um, I'm not strict with the year 2023. So uh, whatever was new in the last uh, in the last uh, weeks, I of course added it to this webinar as well. So let's have a look at it. Um, our first uh, point is the introduction to data integrity. I want to, to just bring three points uh, to your mind um, in the data uh, integrity in general sec section. And before I do that, I will change my HDMI cable uh, to my PC. Because hey, what I'll do in the meantime is I'll start our first poll for the day. What you should yeah, do James. right now. Yes. As planned. <laughs> As planned. Yes, we'll just jump right into and a message, message from our sponsor. Uh, yes, if you look in your poll, you'll be able yeah. to see what do you think was the most common citations in FDA drug warning letters with CGMP related violations for finished product manufacturers in the fiscal year 2023. Um, I've opened up this poll. It should pop up on your screen. Feel free to click on, on any one of those. Um, and what we're going to do is just in a second, look at the, look at the results. Um, oh, we have a 50-50 split right now um, on, on uh, computerized systems and responsibilities of a quality unit. And, and, it's, and it's slowly filling up. So we're going to see how these polls go, how this information goes. I'm going to, I'm going to let this run a little bit. Or I think back to you. Yeah, I hope it works better now. I, uh, I went over the docking station and hope that this is a problem. So um, data integrity in general and data uh, in total is, of course, the backbone of our industry because this is the only control, so to say, that the patient has um, because um, the patient cannot smell or or, or taste whether medication is good or not. And therefore the patient has to rely on the agencies and the regulatory bodies can only um, yeah, do what they see. So they can only judge on the data they get presented. And you might have seen the, the iceberg in the invitation picture of this webinar. That's exactly the view uh, of the agencies. Uh, in particular, FDA always says in an inspection, we can only see the tip of the iceberg. And that's why they like also data integrity so much because it's like a fever thermometer, what's going on in your company, whether you take it serious with a quality management system. So I always like to start, and people who joined uh, our webinars in this Compliance Alliance series know this picture, that data integrity is multidimensional. We got the uh, so-called hard facts like processes, systems, and procedures, and the soft facts like people and culture. And only if all these columns are stable, of course, our building our temple uh, can be stable. Um, and therefore, um, we know the Alcoa principle, but I don't want to, to over theory it today. Um, so the Alcoa principle, I assume you know it, um, is one um, yeah, abbreviation to explain data integrity, which is uh, frequently used by FDA, but also the other agencies, of course. So this is the first thought I want to bring you, the thought of the multidimensionality. The second one is that I want to switch a bit. So I want to switch away from the pure view on data integrity as a compliance activity, but want to turn it around. So um, I believe that we need to have a data culture as a key enabler for data integrity. Um, so that's the mindset. Um, and we need data governance in place. So in the invitation, you can read it's not only about data integrity, but also data governance. And I think this is uh, one core thing which can bring us forward in the industry. Um, because if we got as well data culture and data governance, which can be explained also by the FAIR principle, um, which means uh, we got findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, um, this can almost automatically uh, lead to data integrity. Um, with that, we can then see the Alcoa principle rather as an output uh, than just as a principle which needs to be fulfilled. So I think this uh, three sounds, so to say, um, is always important to keep in mind. Um, and we will talk more about data governance throughout this talk. Ulrich, I think it's it's great to also mention a huge shout out to the to the uh, uh, persons who have helped us, uh, the mm -hmm. other great minds in this in this journey as well. Yeah, so um, yeah, I always refer to to Kier, Kier Henrici uh, gave a great great talk on data culture, 
um, in the PDA meeting um, we were together and I'm co-leading the data integrity interest group of PDA uh, with her. So um, uh, thanks for the for the hint and great uh, shootout for her, shout out. And Yash um, is a uh, main author, so to say, of a bioforum paper, uh, which uh, handles uh, the fair data principle. And this is very um, important paper because I think it can guide us uh, quite a lot, not only through through data issues, data quality issues, but also uh, through the whole uh, quality by design uh, paradigm through the uh, manufacturing uh, life cycle. In the meantime, we wish the poll results are mm -hmm. also in. So the, the winner of it, I would say, with 36% of the votes is uh, control over computerized systems. That would be the audience's vote on the item that has the most citations and FDA drug warning letters. That's cool, and I will come back to that later. Um, James, if you just run the second poll right now, um, it's about um, whether people have used the uh, FDA uh, inspection dashboard. Perfect. So yes. it. it's, this one's a simple one. It's a yes or no answer. There is no maybe. Um, so it's very <laughs> binary here. Uh, speaking of data. So do us a favor, please. And if you've seen it, if you've used it, if you're aware of it, just go ahead and click on yes. And if it's completely new to you, just click on no. We are going to be talking about this in the next couple of slides. Yeah, and I will show you how to use it so you can learn it. So uh, this is a, the second thought was uh, the stepwise from culture to uh, governance to integrity. And the third thought I want to bring in the introduction is um, the life cycle thought, because I think that's sometimes a bit overseen. So that we have a data life cycle, I think more or less everybody knows who read the guidelines. Um, we got the, the yeah well-defined data life cycle, EMA, FDA, they, they don't have a big difference there in defining this uh, data life cycle from creation over the use uh, to the destruction of the data. However, this is not standing alone. Uh, we got computer systems where electronic data reside on. So nowadays uh, we are going away in principle uh, from paper records and going more to computerized system and electronic data or should go there. And of course, these also have a, a life cycle. And it can be uh, very important to consider that um, when we think about retirement, system retirement. So where do we put our data? But for our talk today, this will play a role for the operations. Um, so for the for the applied controls during the operational phase, as you can see it here, uh, following the GAMP model, of course. And last but not least, and um, this is a new tone, um, we will come back uh, in the talk often, is to see the product lifecycle as a whole. So we are not only focusing on the manufacturing or on the commercial phase, but we see the agencies uh, to have more look also on the pre-commercial phase, phases like uh, development, uh, process development, um, the CMC section of the application and uh, good clinical practices, uh, as we will see um, in the main chapter. Do we have a result for our poll, James? Absolutely. We have uh, 65 to 35 uh, saying it's new. So uh, I think I think we're going to be able to add value today uh, to help out to help out the majority of our audience understand how the FDA inspection dashboard works. Great. Um, so getting to the FDA inspection dashboard is, is straightforward. So you you go to uh, Google or whatever uh, search engine you like. So we don't do any promotion here, and uh, you can do it live now if you want. If you're on your PC and you want to to do it live. Uh, just follow uh, the instruction. So you go to the FDA inspection day, uh, dashboard, uh, then you will find it directly um, here. It takes a while, depending on your uh, Wi-Fi speed. Um, and then you got all the data. Um, one reason why we are often using FDA as consultants uh, is uh, that the data is available. So we got a lot of data available from, from the US American agency, uh, which is not the case. And I will show that in a moment uh, in this extent uh, from the European ones. Okay, so now you can see a, a nice dashboard um, and you can see uh, that we got here uh, trends already. However, it's Food and Drug Association and uh, it contains much more than we are interested in. So therefore I will go to the filter section. So you will find on the top left, uh, the filters, uh, and the first thing I do, let's assume we're now only looking at drugs. I go to product type and choose drugs as a filter. And then I tick my checkbox here. 
and you can see it's it's reacting um, live, so to say, uh, and then uh, we can have a first look at our data, and from there we can already draw the first conclusions. So here on the left side, uh, you can see uh, the the number of inspections in blue. It's the domestic, so the inner U.S. inspections, and in in purple you see the foreign inspections, and you can see that there is a trend, and the trend is downwards. So um, it's sorted by fiscal year. Fiscal years, uh, you have to know that in the States are from October to September. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, James, uh, but I think that's a fiscal year. Um, and uh, 2024 is, of course, not, not yet very representative. So what we can do, if you want to do that, we can also change the fiscal year and take, uh, take out the 2024. I will just go with 23 and then 10 years, let's say. So it would be from 14. OK. And it would have been too easy to take January to December. The rest of the world does that. <laughs> but um, it's kind of like the metric and imperial system, right? So there's also different measurements. So it's great yeah. to have that and be aware that there is a difference between the uh, year and the fiscal year. Yeah. And what is not in this uh, dashboard, and that's important because then it makes sense, um, if there is still a communication ongoing after an inspection, the inspection will not be found yet uh, in this database. So what you can see here is um, that we got a downward trend in, in uh, domestic inspections and the upward trend in foreign inspections until 2019. Um, so this was more or less a trend. Uh, the one or other of you who has been uh, active in the industry in this uh, time know that there was a big hype uh, cycle on data integrity uh, which never really stopped uh, but this was where, where we got the uh, all the big cases for example in india or china but not limited to we got also many cases in the states then guess what it goes down uh, this is of course the COVID break uh, you can see in the foreign inspection there were hard um, travel restrictions and therefore of course the number of inspection went down dramatically but what i find interesting is um, it never went up again. So uh, now we're in a status um, where it's about, yeah, let's say 60% of the pre-COVID um, scenario. So we got really lower uh, inspection rates uh, than we had before. Um, and I would say you can calculate it with, by the numbers here. It's about 60%. So you can see that you can uh, draw easily trends from here. But of course, that's not all. Now we got a bit, uh, went a bit into the time series. Uh, we could also be interested into the into the citations, for example. Um, first go to this bar chart. You can see that more or less half of the inspection lead to a voluntary action or official action uh, indicated by the agencies, whereas the other half, uh, there's no action indicated, uh, which means that there's, there's no observation, uh, no 43 and no warning letter cited. So that's, that's pretty stable and it's, it's always around 50-50. And here you can also see uh, what are really the, the findings. Um, these are now not only related to, to warning letters, but also to, to the uh, 483s. And you can see that here in this case, uh, procedures not in writing fully followed uh, is leading. Um, one other thing we, we had uh, is um, the, the uh, investigation of, of discrepancies uh, we had in our or Paul, uh, but I will show a report later where you where you find it very well sorted. Uh, what is the number one cause? And I think this is very important. Um, for example, if you if you got suppliers, you you might uh, check the FDA dashboard for their compliance actions in advance um, and supporting your your audit and your uh, yeah third party management program. Now I will do something uh, a final action. Um, you know we are in Germany, so I want to. Uh, really nail it down to Germany as last last one that you can. I think then you have a feel and touch about this dashboard, and uh, of course you can do much more with it. Uh, you can play around a bit with it, and then you you can make use of that. Um, so we got Germany here. Okay, so our filter is running. You can see that we got about thirty uh, inspections last year in Germany, last fiscal year. And um, again, you can see the findings. And if you go down, you can even see for uh, some, but not all of the inspections, uh, the um, the uh, description of the um, of the observations. 
Interestingly, and this is the last point I'm showing you, uh, you can also uh, go to the FEI number, which is standing for a specific site, and you can even see the inspection history. So we're clicking here, and then we can see uh, without naming out a specific company, I just took the first one, which was there. Um, and then you can see for the site, the inspection history, you can see that this site, whatever it is, had three inspections in the last six years, and that uh, one went without observation, two went without observations, and one we had uh, a, a um, voluntary action indicated. A483 will be um, publicly, uh, is not publicly yet, yet available in this case, I know that, um, but it's uh, it has been written. Good. Um, that brings me back to the presentation. So I, I, I found it worthwhile uh, to share with you this uh, this little uh, walkthrough through the inspection um, inspection database. Um, and yeah, of course, it's not only the FDA, which is uh, which is active in in the in the uh, in the area of of drug compliance, but it's also the EMA. And EMA is much uh, much more sparse on data, so there we only can see uh, the non-compliance report, reports. And um, in the reports, um, I just took all of them, which were present from January 2023. It's about it's 10, I believe, if I remember correctly. And I was just checking whether data integrity is still a big topic. Answer is simple, yes, it is. So we got in these um, um, reports, explicitly mentioned data integrity six times from 10 times, so 60%. So I think you can say it's valid to say um, that all the agencies have data integrity or uh, data issues uh, in their uh, in their scope. And I think that's uh, stable throughout the last, um, I'm doing that since nine years for the last uh, nine years. That's, that's a stable trend. Good. I, I think I think there's one one really good thing to add on to here, yep. uh, Ulrich. Um, if you can just go back to that to that previous slide. Um, mm -hmm. So as we can see, the FDA is very open about their publications. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. taxpayers money at work. Um, the EMA is is European funded, um, and they they are they are somewhat open, and they're putting it out there. Now, one of the things, just like Ulrich had said in his demonstration, as well as in this slide right here, uh, don't the, the numbers are not ultimates. So that doesn't yeah. mean that's the only source of truth. It doesn't mean oh, there were only six DI inspections. So I guess I don't have to worry about it because both regulatory agencies. Are are actually uh, imploring the the industry to self govern. So it's a lot mm -hmm. of self governance. It's a lot of quality assurance. It's a lot of quality governance. Uh, things that we'll also be talking about today here. Uh, but the main message is, if you want to see uh, what has happened, you can you can read those warning letters. You can read the 483s. You can read the inspection reports. It's a great source of knowledge, as it's the FDA's quickest way to speak with industry. But it doesn't yeah. mean it's the only source of knowledge, and it doesn't mean if it's not on the list that it's not important. Because what happens is the, the inspection agencies are actually pushing that burden to industry and saying, you need to have a good quality system in place. You need to have your governance in place. And with that in place, we won't have that many findings. So just to, that there was that hype that Ulrich had mentioned about inspection hype. It, it didn't slow down. It's just they got their hands full with a lot of post-COVID um, inspections that they have to go to as well. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, thank you, James. So um, now I'll give you some some uh, short updates. There were many guidelines out, and uh, it's hard to 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 meet a collection to to hit a collection of those because um, yeah, many of them are important. Uh, to myself, I would say the ICH Q9 quality risk management update, um, the revision one, uh, went final in March last year, I think. Uh, this was the most dominant one. Uh, why is that? Because uh, quality risk management is in all the life cycle stages of a medicinal product, and it's it's all in all our decisions. So it's very very important, and yeah, it's just very relevant. Um, the core principles are that it's our decisions should be driven patient centric, uh, which means of course we should have risk to product quality in mind, and it should be based on scientific knowledge. I think this is one quote, which is very important. We want to have explicit knowledge 
explicit knowledge means that it's backed up by numbers uh, or by research. And a very uh, important new, new topic uh, in the revision is uh, the product availability, because product availability has been a big issue uh, in the past year, in the past years probably. Um, we saw that also in COVID, uh, what happens when supply chains break down. And of course, also quality issues can uh, break down our, our um, yeah, supply with uh, life necessary uh, medicinal products. So many patients can die if a product doesn't have the quality which it has to have, which is intended to, but also uh, many patients can can die if a medicine is not available. And um, that was last year, FDA was hit by such a case. I will come back to that later where they ha had to had to do um, hard trade-offs uh, for compliance and availability. So this is uh, one one new tone in the in the guidelines, and I think it's very important. And the second one is uh, the commensurate uh, formality and effort with the risk. So we shouldn't shoot with um, all power with FMEAs on each and every problem, uh, but we should uh, use adequate formality, adequate uh, effort for our risk assessment, which you could also call critical thinking, as it's for example outlined in the in the PICS guideline on data integrity. If you are interested in a deeper dive on that, uh, go to our homepage. Uh, we got a very nice webinar uh, dedicated to, to ICHQ9 update. Um, and therefore today I will also keep it uh, that short as, as it is. The second field uh, which had a lot of attention last year was uh, AIML, so artificial intelligence machine learning. Here we had uh, three major guidelines coming out and a complete new tone in the guidelines coming out. Um, because uh, these papers were called discussion papers. Um, so FDA published two discussion papers, um, one on AI ML in drug manufacturing and one in the uh, development, uh, drug development. So you can see in the different life cycle phase of the drugs, different guidelines. Um, I was participating in the commenting of, of both of them uh, via PDA. So there are also comments out uh, where you can read uh, the answer, so to say, on this on these guidelines. And what I mentioned with a new tone is that FDA here asks eight questions. So it's really like seeking guidance or seeking also some, some advice or direction uh, from the industry, which is, I think, a, a new way of, uh, of, of writing regulatory guidelines. EMA had a similar guideline, uh, which covers the whole uh, product life cycle um, and uh, was published, uh, I think, in September, no, in July, here we got it. Um, and also here uh, we had a uh, comment in the PDA. Um, and interestingly, all the agencies also ha held um, knowledge sharing sessions on these guidelines. So there were workshops um, where we participated um, in order to, yeah, to be up to speed uh, with what the regulators have to say and what they propose. So this is a very hot field. Um, I could make two webinars on that, of course, uh, but just uh, for your uh, background, this. Uh, this is where data quality comes into place because we cannot run uh, this um, analy analytical algorithms uh, if we don't have our data correctly in place. So if we don't run data governance, um, for example, if the format is not right, or if we have biased data, we will not get the right results, uh, which then will, of course, guide us wrong in the quality decisions. Orbisha, a question came up yeah. right in the middle, and I just want to let everyone know, if you look in the Q&A session, you'll see a mm -hmm. question about the links. Uh, to the EMA database. And what I've done is I answered it and I put both of the links in there that Ulrich just showed. So from the right. EMA as well as the FDA dashboard. Um, so you could just copy and paste those as well and you'll have access to the same data that, that we just showed in the demo. Yeah, and the recording will be will be online afterwards. Um, so if you want to to go back to to something, um, you will get a will get a, a message a mail uh, when the recording is available, and then you can go back to the slides and have a look there. Great, thank you, James. Um, we had also a dedicated webinar on ICH E6. So that's good clinical practice. Uh, we had a webinar two weeks ago, um, and. What we can see here is a clear trend uh, that um, it comes together. So the GMP um, thoughts on data integrity, data governance, they of course also apply for the pre-commercial phases like um, a good clinical practice. So we got the quality by design principle now um, explicitly named in, in GCP. Um, and there's their own chapter on data governance uh, in the new guideline, which is a, which is a 
quite big change, I would say, in comparison uh, to the uh, revision two, which was out before. This is in draft status, um, so it's now in the in the public commenting uh, mode, so to say, um, and we will see and and observe how it develops further. Then um, the quality management maturity program from FDA is still ongoing, and I want to share this uh, thought with you because um, here it comes more or less all together. So um, FDA is running a program in order to, to foster uh, quality culture and of course to minimize risk to product availability and market supply. Here you see again this thought from ICHQ9 um, uh, supply chain management. And there are five um, areas, five practice areas they mention explicitly. Um, it's a management commitment, business continuity, uh, the advanced pharmaceutical quality system, which you can see as, let's say, the next step from, from the quality system as it's outlined, for example, in ICHQ10, um, technical excellence uh, and employee engagement. And when I was reading that, I was directly remind, reminded of the, um, of the temple I showed. Yeah, it's very similar. You got the uh, leadership component, you got the technical component, you got the mindset component here. And of course, uh, this makes sense because we can only build a strong building of quality, not only data integrity, on top of, of these components. So here they explicitly mention that we have to invest in learning new technical skills. And I strongly believe that this is one of our biggest issues in the industry currently. Um, so we need to uh, educate professionals, for example, in the quality system, quality professionals uh, on, on data technologies. Um, let it be as simple as dashboarding, uh, but also as complicated as machine learning algorithms. And they explicitly mention here the Alcoa principle, um, but what I want to go out here more is um, the assessment may also review how effective an establishment is at synthesizing information from different sources. Because I think this is uh, the trend forward. Synthesizing information from different sources means that our data is interoperable. If you think back about the FAIR principle before, uh, this means that we can then enable new technologies um, like dashboarding, like uh, artificial intelligence and so on, and really get something out of our data. I think another poll question, we don't have it here, but but a great poll question at this time would kind of be, uh, when you hear about interoperability of data, what tool comes to mind other than Excel? Um, but yes, if we, a lot of the a lot of the experience that we have within within our our, our clients and within the environments is uh, the guidance is there. It's clear to say have interoperability. Make sure you have streamlined data structures to to really bring it all together. And then when you look back at it, there's either an Excel sheet or a multitude of Excel sheets somewhere on a on a on a local hard drive, or there's paper-based processes somewhere in the middle. And when that happens, it's really difficult to bring that streamlining in. So, so we are aware of it, just to let you guys know, if you have that in your organization, you're not alone. Um, this is really a piece when we talk about data governance is moving forward within the industry, uh, leveling up to be fully streamlined end-to-end -end data structures. Thank you, James, yeah. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, Last trend for this for this section is um, pre-approval inspection. So there was a, a change in the pre-approval inspection protocol from FDA. Um, and this is remarkable because there was a very recent change before. So there was added a objective for this pre-approval inspection. So FDA comes on site and wants to see whether the, uh, the site is capable of manufacturing the drug according to the application. Um, and one is the data integrity audit. So that goes very strongly into the um, life cycle view of a medicinal product. So uh, pre-commercial activities are important um, and all the data which support your application. But this was 2019 and now they added another objective which is the commitment to quality in pharmaceutical development. Um, so here they also uh, cross refer to the quality management maturity white paper I just mentioned. And I think this is remarkable because this is a, a typical frequently asked question we get at our customers. So when does GMP start? And we get aware or we know that this is, might be the wrong question. So we need to have a total quality system around uh, our complete um, product lifecycle. This, this also includes R&D activities and goes then into the, into the FDA regulated or um, 
agency regulated activities uh, like like process validation, uh, process development, and uh, good clinical practices. And last but not least, uh, here is the CEDAR um, annual report for the last fiscal year. Uh, we talked about a lot of that. And the winner in our poll would have been responsibilities of a quality unit, quality control unit. Um, but I would count uh, control and testing of components, which is the QC activity more or less, um, uh, with 47 to 48, I would count both as winners. So it's not the uh, computerized system. And uh, maybe one word to that. Um, we always think about computerized system when we talk about data integrity, but uh, as most of you might know, um, 21 CFR Part 11, electronic records and signatures, um, is called up uh, by a predicate rule, and uh, the predicate rule will be cited in the warning letter. Um, and here, for example, behind these, uh, especially quality control um, activities, there's very often a data integrity issue behind it. So, for example, testing into compliance uh, would fall into this um, into this uh, testing of um, components um, area, and then you would have a data classical data integrity finding in in this area. I, I think what I think that's a really important point, Ulrich. The the, the predicate mm -hmm. rule stories here. You're not going to find inspection findings on a 21 CFR Part 11, uh, which is which is electronic data, data and records uh, and signatures mm -hmm. act. Uh, you're also not going to find e EMA guidance on Annex 11. But what you're going to find is you're going to find pieces on 21 CFR 211.68b because it really talks about what's happening at that quality level. How is that quality system uh, breaking apart? Or how is that quality system having vulnerabilities that could influence the, the stability or the quality of the product at the end of the day? So, so these guidelines that came out, they're great, they're important, they're, 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 they're necessary, but you won't find findings on those. You'll always see them based on the predicate rules uh, that are out there. And, uh, and those are not new, uh, 19, 1978. Um, yeah. Older than myself. So, yeah. yeah. So you should better be compliant with, with this old stuff. So uh, now now we, we come to the yeah, last uh, main part. Um, I can share uh, many, many findings with you. Uh, please feel still feel free to, to put in any questions you have. Uh, but I but I selected some and I selected them in a way to uh, to explain the trends I see in in the um, yeah, in the inspection uh, documents uh, from FDA. As we saw, uh, we got the FDA information available. So number one is um, we see much more pre-commercial enforcement. So here's one example from uh, Samsung Biologics. Um, it's I'm, I apologize for the for the quality of the scan, but it's the the raw scan which is uh, published in the FDA side. Um, so here it's about a manufacturing. Um, scientific analytic technology lab. So it's a lab which supports the application, which shows um, whether the, the site is able to, uh, to um, produce according to the application. And um, we didn't see so many findings on that before. So that's really more or less new. Um, that being said, that's the first point here, which is remarkable. And the second point is that it's talking a lot about uh, audits, internal audits, assessments, and, and how it all comes together. And we can very well relate with that as um, as uh, consultants in this area. So what I want to show you here is um, they they had uh, this findings here. In the first page, you see uh, the very classical data integrity findings you should, shouldn't have nowadays anymore, shared administration passwords, no data backup, and lack of audit trails or lack of audit trail reviews. So if I now uh, unreveal trends, something new, be aware that this is always present. So uh, the old trends, like we don't review our audit trails, we don't save uh, the data, um, we seek testing and compliance. That's the, the, the ground noise, which uh, is always staying there. So you can find a lot on that, just as a side note. But what, what, what they did here really, and I, I think that's interesting, um, they had first a, a taught audit very, very back in the past. I think it was 2013, if I remember correctly. Here they didn't find any data integrity issues, although they, of course, have already been there. Then there was another internal audit, uh, and a deviation was opened. Um, shared account and missing data backups. Um, there was a mitigation action, which is quite weak, and said, yeah, we, we need to do logbook entries. So uh, procedural control was, was drawn instead of a, 
um, technical control. But at least something was done, was uncovered. Then there was a third audit because guess what? Nothing happened after this deviation. So it wasn't really handled correctly. So we got a third audit and now our cuppers were opened. Um, and um, now the, the data integrity uh, gaps were assessed in cuppers, but still they were not resolved. What happened then? A, a client, a contract giver made another audit and found some um, issues with the passwords. You remember they, they used generic accounts in the past and it was still not resolved there. So um, shared administration account was present in 2022. So given that, um, throughout eight years or something, however this, however long this timeline was, uh, the issue was assessed and assessed, but not really tackled. Um, and you can say this is um, there's some death by kappa, death by assessment. Uh, sometimes it's also used, of course, as a shield to, to set something uh, into the window so that the inspector sees something, but uh, not really action is happening. Um, and this is a very, very nice case uh, where you can see that this, of course, doesn't solve your problems, which is logical. A nice extra add-on on this case is um, that um, they didn't have the um, so this is a core finding. They didn't address it in a timely manner. It took uh, seven years or something, which is not timely. Noteworthy, we see the first time, and to my knowledge, uh, the term data quality in a, in a 483. So uh, I didn't see data quality before. Um, this is another uh, interesting fact on this finding. And they didn't uh, inform their clients. So if you have a data integrity issue um, and you see that they found it in September 2022, and the client notification range from October to January, which is not so much later. Um, but you see that the the FDA is taking a yeah a um, eye on this uh, notification because it protects in the end the supply chain. So this is uh, probably a service provider also a contract lab, um, and it could affect a lot of the supply chain. And of course, the agencies want this information to go out as fast as possible. which is of course in line with the, with the guideline I just showed you uh, with the pre-approval inspection program. The second case is uh, going into a similar direction now in the, in the commercial phase. Um, and it tells us something about how long data integrity couples should take. Because here we got a, a similar story. Um, again, there, there was this classical uh, data integrity issues. In this case, it's uh, this kind of um, standalone devices. Probably you all know them. Um, it's a it's a non-viable particle counter. Um, so you really buy it out of the box. Um, it has sometimes all the capabilities. In this case, they just didn't use it. Um, so the technical capabilities were there, but weren't used. And then what happens, of course, there's a assessment and a kappa is, is initiated. Um, also other devices had this issue. What I found very interesting here is uh, that we can find dates in this 483. So August 17th in 2023, the couple was opened, but upgrades have not yet been uh, completed. So no upgrade of a series of devices, of several devices uh, until February. So this is to my knowledge, the first time uh, where you can extract something like a time duration for the kappas, which is very re highly relevant for, for uh, most of our customers. So it shouldn't be the case that your kappa is lying around for 4.5 months without any action. So you should have, of course, it could be that you don't have finished everything in this time frame. However, there should be a significant load of action uh, done in, in order to, um, to be trustable by the inspector. Then the next big trend, and I'm, I'm very um, observing this uh, since two years, I think, is uh, the completeness of data in manufacturing. So um, in the past, FDA was very much focusing on the quality control area, so on the, on the lab, and um, was putting the, the data integrity findings together there. But especially in the last year, we saw many findings like this, um, that we have, uh, manufacturing or pro production equipment, um, which do not have, for example, in this case, the ability to, to store and print alarms. So I think um, 
some of you might know the situation. You got an old device in your machine park and it doesn't have the technical capability. So here we got first the issue of outdated devices. What happened here is um, that we didn't have technical controls in place. Um, therefore, what are we doing? If we don't have technical com uh, controls in place, uh, we are implementing mitigation actions or, or intermediate controls, which are procedural controls. Um, and that's what this company has done. Um, so they, they added a form, a maintenance request form, um, where all the alarms uh, should be recorded. Now, if you think about a, a request form with all alarms, um, this already sounds like a like a hard thing. Yeah. So in manufacturing, you're you have many um, machines around you, and alarms are are coming out of these machines uh, all the time. So putting all the alarms into the same pot is probably already um, one of the the main root causes because what of course happened then, uh, no alarm was reported. So we got here the the finding. Uh, the firm didn't report any alarms, so the procedural controls were not followed. Um, they were acknowledged uh, without documentation, these alarms. Um, and uh, for 2022 and 23, so for two years, they didn't have a single alarm listed, which clearly indicates uh, that the company did, did it wrong, so that they were just not documented. And this brings us back to the quality risk management thought, because um, one of the biggest challenges in data integrity projects is always data review. So how do we review the mass amount of data we have, in particular in manufacturing, that we might have even much more data than in quality control? Um, and the FDA guideline on data integrity tells us uh, that we have to review all production data, which is uh, fairly said impossible. You cannot review all the all the uh, manufacturing data because it could be one gigabyte or something. So humanly, it's not possible. So what do we have to do? Of course, we have to use a quality system approach, quality risk management uh, to implement a adequate level of oversight onto our, our records. That does not mean that we review each and every entry in our, um, in our manufacturing site. So we don't need to review all the alarms. We don't need to report all of the alarms into the batch report, but the important ones. So we need to have an activity which divides our um, data set into very relevant, relevant so that I review it maybe every three months or something and uh, not GMP relevant, but maybe important for maintenance. Yeah, And if we have this in place, we can build up something, uh, a system uh, where we put only the relevant into the batch record and we have a, where we have a review by exception. That's uh, the term uh, used for this approach. I think I think there's another very interesting point um, to bring in that that's not really within the within the FDA quality system, but it comes more out of out of cross industries um, and it comes from an educational background. Amy Edmondson is a professor for psychology and she actually brought out a book uh, uh, late last year called The Right Kind of Wrong. Um, and, and in that book, The Right Kind of Wrong, she describes three types of failures. She talks about basic failures uh, that are things that were well-known, published information that were just ignored or just forgotten or just overseen. Uh, she talks about complex system failures where you have a chain of events that causes a failure. And then she talks about intelligent failures. So really intelligent failures, things that, that you're expecting to make failures and, and do that. And when we look at life sciences, we'd expect to see a lot of intelligent-based failures because intelligent failures being on, I have a hypothesis, I'm testing something, I'm trying to get a new molecule, I'm trying to understand what's happening in here, and, and there's, you know, we're expecting to see things go wrong. But she does make a big case for that in that book um, that you should eliminate basic failures as best possible, and you should always keep an, an, a very close watch on complex system failures. So if one end uh, uh, you know, breaks down, how does it go through, how does it go through the other end? And if we look at these examples, Ulrich, that you just kind of put together, I mm -hmm. wouldn't say that those are intelligent failures. It doesn't seem like anyone sat down and said, let me make a an hypothesis and, and see how far my system can go without me fixing it. I, I believe that usually comes down to the, um, 
well, A, the politics within organizations, and B, you know, people are busy. Everyone has a lot of work on their list. And when you go to your manager and you say, I have this problem, what do they say? They say, well, let's not worry about that now. We got we got a hundred other things that we have to fix. Or they say, come back when you know what the solution of it is, but you have a very limited budget. So this is kind of what we see within the industry. Um, but these examples here are really showing that even when you have internal audits and internal information and you're aware of it internal, that may just appear again in another uh, in a warning letter or in an FDA uh, information because they can they can actually have access to it fully uh, to, to, to build a case around. It. So yeah. I think that's a key element there to, 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 to key appropriate. Yeah. And to, to add on that, um, I, I had some more cases on, on the completeness of data and FDA um, uses also data which is available. So they are really data driven now in the inspections. So there was another case uh, where they had the assumption that microbiologists were making up experiments, experiment results, which is of course a, a really rude and hard uh, case of fraud. Uh, and they were able to prove it with the, with the entry locks into the clean room area. So uh, they could show that uh, people weren't at all there in the in the um, in the entry uh, in in the clean room area, and therefore they also didn't didn't pick their their samples. Um, good. Last case for today um, is about the uh, maybe you you read it in the news, the Inters case, um, which is an an, an Indian um, uh, generica and, and API manufacturer. And here the FDA exactly came into this into this issue, like. Um, compliance action versus a drug availability. When I was in the States last year for a workshop, um, I saw in the breakfast news, you say, you know, um, the Americans always like to watch TV, whatever they do, also during breakfast, of course. And uh, there was a, a lady um, who was interviewed and she doesn't have drugs for her breast cancer um, because um, there are disruptions in the, in the drug supply chain. And it is proven that quality issues are the biggest uh, driver of, of supply chain issues. Um, that's what FDA proved, for example, before they started this quality mat maturity uh, um, program. Uh, I, I was talking before about that. Um, and there it comes together. And that's that's the reason why uh, ICH uh, Q9 is taking this into account. Um, and that can also be a reason for us to use new technologies because we can make more drugs available and we shouldn't let us hinder uh, alone from, from, the, um, from the problems, from the issues, so to say, uh, but we should, should bring it in. So I, want to, I, I will jump a bit over that now. Please bear with me. Um, but I want to bring in one key thought. I took that from this warning letter, but I could have taken 10 other uh, warning letters in the last last year or last years it's about uh, the the process performance process uh, uh, validation it's no longer sufficient to just have a process tested once with three batches um, and let it run for the lifetime but fda asks us asks us to have uh, vigilant monitoring so they call it here uh, and this is the response to this letter section response to this letter section is this section where uh, FDA can speak very directly to the industry, as James mentioned, it's a quick way, um, quicker than a guidance. And they say um, that we need to have ongoing attention on both intra-batch and inter-batch variation. And how can we cover intra-batch and inter-batch variation? Of course, only with connected data. Then we can see quality signals from internal data and also from the field, also from customers. Um, so uh, we should also have a view like we do now today onto uh, recent uh, findings. We should uh, have a look into the FDA database, but also in other databases and should, should use uh, this data, which is available to detect signals. Um, and ongoing knowledge uh, of signals from process performance uh, for improvement. I think that's the core. And uh, with that, I want to, to highlight a, a workshop we are giving. Uh, on quality intelligence. Um, I'll be giving that um, uh, in May together with Peter Baker from Live OQA. Um, and we will talk about exactly this uh, topic, how we use data to make our quality management more intelligent, more intelligent, which we call quality intelligent. Um, it will be taking place in Boston, uh, but there's also a virtual option available. So um, I can only highlight this, uh, sign up for that. Uh, that will be very interesting. We don't have a pop-up for 999, but 
do sign up. It's great. It's great. Yeah. Knowledge. So this is my three inspection trends, and with that, I, I will already conclude because I think we have another question in, in the queue. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. Thank you, Orish. Uh, yeah. So three three questions came in. I did answer them in the chat, but I'll just highlight them real quick. One was about the links. It's in the chat. Another one was should manufacturers assess equipment for these types of deficiencies before purchasing the equipment? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so this is supplier qualification. It's not just a one-time task. You know, they signed off. They're ISO certified. We're all happy. No, no, no. You got to kind of go through it over and over holistically, systemically, and yeah. go back and make sure that um, that you know that they're up, up to the stuff. And what is, what is the key document for that? It's a URS, and it's often done too late. So often, in reality, it's clear the purchasing decision is clear, and then the URS is written. And that's the, the sin behind that. Yeah, that's that's where it goes wrong. You have to have your requirements available and then purchase the equipment. And and finally, we have another question. If sites are following USP 1058 and have defined equipment qualification based on the standards, can mm -hmm. inspectors still push for Part 11 compliance if they disagree with the equipment classification? Uh, also, that's a clear yes. Uh, and the reason is it's important to consider the intended use of each part of, of your process. So whatever, mm -hmm. whatever equipment, system, data, Excel spreadsheet or paperwork that you have, it has an intended use. And that intended use, there is an upstream and a downstream risk to, to the product of having that. Uh, Peter Baker, a big shout out there always to, to Peter Baker. Uh, he always calls it the so what question. So mm -hmm. a lot of times he, he teaches this great class on inspector training. And when you're going through it, you find tons of different problems but he always asks so what what is the impact to the product what is the impact to the patient and that's the question you always need to ask when you're looking at holistic risk management so what are the risks what what risks could be introduced and if something goes wrong in this process step does it have an effect on the product or on the patient at the end of the day um and as always uh, as you pointed out um you know not getting a product is 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 a significant risk to the patient because mm -hmm. supply chain breakdown uh that means that that patients just don't get the necessary medicine mm -hmm. um, those were the questions that were in the chat Ulrich, I, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up thank you for your time Ulrich, and thank you thank you thank everyone you. for joining us today um I, I'll, I'll give the closing words to Ulrich. In the, in the handout section here, you'll find a flyer. Uh, you can contact us using that. It gives you a little bit more information of, of what we're doing. Like I said, we'll be posting this online as well. Ulrich, closing words. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the participation. Thank you for the question. Uh, please always feel free to informally reach out uh, also via LinkedIn. Um, I'm always happy to collect some FAQs also for the webinars, um, but also from personal interest. So feel free to reach out. And yeah, I'm looking forward uh, to meeting you again in one of our next sessions. Have a good day or evening, depending where you are. Yes, everyone, have a great day. Final words from our sponsor. Look at our LinkedIn page. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we promise we won't spam you too much. Um, but there's a lot of great information out there we're happy to share. Um, and if you have any questions, just reach out. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you on your mission to provide to provide life-changing medicines to, to the industry. So thank you very much for attending the Compliance Alliance session here and have a great, have a great rest of the week, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.